The Thinking Deeper report is out there. Um, really, my presentation reflects the, the main points coming out of that. Uh, as was mentioned earlier, uh, I suppose the, uh, the idea for this came from Joe Curtin from the IIEA. They came and talked to us in SEAI, and we agreed to co-write it with them and do some research. So just to introduce it, I'm going to talk a little bit about the current environment out there. So, you know, what's the playing field for us? What are we trying to do and, and what do people think? Then a little bit about what do we mean when we say deeper retrofit? What, what are we really trying to achieve? Then looking at various financing options. And we weren't looking to create something new that hasn't been tried and tested anywhere. We were looking at international pilots, international tests, uh, ideas that are out there already, and just looking at how have they worked in other countries and how might they work in the Irish situation, talking at both the supply and demand side, so talking to the people who would be offering these options and then talking to the most important people of all, the consumers, and what would they like. So just to set the environment first, the task, what are we trying to do? And people have talked about this already. It's 20% energy efficiency target by 2020. That means 1 million buildings. It means achieving another 8,000 gigawatt hours of savings. We have better energy, the program, to do that, which is great. We have the energy suppliers coming on board to get involved in the market to push this even further. We have a, a great co cohort of contractors out there already, very active in the market. So on that side, the, the scene is set. But what are the challenges? Well, for us, the challenges, of course, are the economy at the moment, and I don't just mean the Irish economy. Internationally, we have a challenge there. We can even see the Asian stock markets this morning are in a little bit of trouble. So we, we all have to be conscious of that. But at the same time, look, this is a problem at present. It's going to change. Things will get better. Um, but another challenge there just within the present circumstances is when you're talking to a homeowner, some of these people are in negative equity and, and again on the supply side, you know, if a bank is looking at somebody in negative equity, are they happy to lend on that? If a consumer is facing negative equity and high mortgage uh, rates, you know, do they want to borrow? How are we going to finance things? And then the, the final challenge is we do need to look beyond exchequer grants. Exchequer grants on their own can't achieve the, the depth and scale that we want in any way. As a country, we can't afford that. So a little bit about the supply factor uh, that we have to look at. Bank lending policies at the moment, I suppose we were uh, reading some research and it talked about liquidity constraints back in the 1980s. And I think here we are in 2011 and we need to be talking about that again. Um, banks have loan to deposit ratios that have been at about 160%. Part of the deal in Ireland getting money from Europe and the IMF is those sort of ratios need to come down. So obviously banks need to look at credit assessment, needs to lower their risk exposure. Within that they're looking at payback, we need to move them to looking at return on investment because something in investing in energy efficiency, it is the investment that keeps giving. It's not just about payback. You know, you will have your loan payback and you know what? You're still going to be gleaning savings from that investment. So that's a positive there. Uh, again, banks need to look at what are the appropriate discount factors they'll do in, in looking at uh, return on investment and, and credit assessment. And we need to look at what's the proven case for energy efficiency because at the moment, we say it makes savings, but we need to, to put, I suppose, collateral out there that the market becomes more confident in that and, and financiers are happy to lend within that consideration. Uh, that graph there is just to, to look at an approximation, looking at um, mortgages going back to 2005 and the sort of numbers we were talking about, and then mortgages now, and we're down at only one-fifth of those sort of mortgages. So again, that's just looking at the, the lending side of things. On the demand side, just looking at consumers, and again, just looking at consumer sentiment, and you can see there that uh, that has reduced quite a bit in the last number of years, and I suppose what you have to say is within that, how do you get consumers to open the purse strings? How do you get them to be happy? On the, the bottom one there is just a trust barometer, and it's probably a little bit hard to see, but you can see Ireland is uh, less than EU or international levels in trust in government, in banks and business. We're not very trusting at the moment. Uh, so I suppose on the, on the banking side, that becomes an issue. You know, who will consumers borrow from? Who will they trust? Again, on the demand side, and Lisa had talked about this a little bit earlier on, there's the split incentives issue. So 
what's the length of tenure? How long is somebody going to be in a home? Do they intend to live in it in the next 20 years? If they're thinking of selling it in three years, are they happy to invest in it? Maybe they think they won't get the cost of the investment back in the sale price. You've also got the, the landlord-tenant issue. You know, a landlord, if he invests in the home, will he get that investment back in rental income? Because he's not going to get it back in the savings and energy bills. It's going to be a tenant who reaps that reward. On the other side, just if somebody does own their home and uh, we're looking at them to invest, there are behavioural factors. People are, are risk adverse. Uh, people procrastinate about purchasing decisions. Uh, you know, I'll think about that. I'll research it a little bit. But you know what? I'll put it on the back burner for the moment, and maybe I'll think about it again next month or next year. Um, there's also social norms, and this is where community groups and, and just getting retrofits out there will change consumer norms. People will, if they see their neighbour doing something, if they see their community doing something, they're much more likely to do it. it there's a little bit of an element of keeping up with the Joneses, but it's also just uh, changing the game. On the information and knowledge side, what we're finding, and Brian Motherway will talk a little bit later in a much more expansive manner about consumers and what they think and how they think and what they might be willing to do. But at the moment, what we're saying is consumers... They're not sure what to do. They, they don't have full knowledge and, and full information. And even if they decide what to do, they're thinking, well, what's, what's the payback? How does pricing work? Um, what do I do? And as we've said already, there are financing issues. You know, savings won't do what we need. If they agree to borrowings, well, who do they borrow from and how do they borrow and what's the payback options? And just a, a small quote there, uh, again, coming from our focus groups that we did, I think I hit a milestone when I paid off my mortgage. I, ne I said never again. So consumers, that's just the, there's a little push we need to, to make there, a little nudge to move them into not being averse to taking borrowings out for smart investments. So then just moving on, what is deep retrofit? What, where are we now and how do we move? So what do we mean by deep retrofit? Well, the sort of measures we're talking about are things like insulation, the roofs and walls, looking at energy efficient boilers and heating controls, air tightness, which is like draft proofing, windows, doors, and then maybe looking at renewables as well. But the important thing about deep, retro deep retrofit is the whole building approach. We want one intervention. Because you don't want somebody saying, OK, well, you know what, I've dry-lined my whole house this year. And then next year they go back and they say, OK, well, you know what, I need to upgrade my heating system. Now you have to start pulling things out, upsetting what you've done already. That's just not the right way to go. We need a whole building approach where the work is done all together. The kind of savings we're talking about are 40 to 50 percent reduction in energy use, and I stress this is average because, as Lisa said earlier on, look, some homes just need a small amount of retrofit to bring them up to the kind of levels we need, but there are other homes who need a very in-depth retrofit. So when I say 40 to 50 percent, we are talking averages. So what's our current position in the Irish housing stock? Well. We estimate, and these are estimates because it is difficult, uh, you're looking at the age of homes and trying to make an assessment on the, the types of buildings at that particular time that they were building, but we reckon that there's about 400,000 homes at a rating of F or G, so those sort of homes need a very deep retrofit. There's another almost 200,000 homes at ratings of E, so again, quite an intense retrofit needed in those homes. This year, we're looking to retrofit 60,000 homes, and I stress that in the, the private home sector, uh, we'll do an additional 20,000 in um, people who are in fuel poverty in the warmer homes area. But the important thing is the average investment that we're seeing at the moment is only 3,000 of an investment, and that will save about 400 gigawatt hours, those 60,000 homes per annum. Where do we need to in the f move to in the future? We need to be moving to doing about 100,000 homes a year, and we need an average of around 10,000 of an investment. Some will be 5,000, some will be up towards 15,000. And we need to be moving to savings of about 1,000 gigawatt hours per annum. So quite a, a step change needed there. Now, just to look a little bit at the financing options, and again to say we, we looked at international research about what was out there. We talked to stakeholders and suppliers to see what did they think about the various options, what did they think, were the good things about them, what challenges or barriers they feel might exist, and the most important thing of all, what was the consumer view, what did they think about it. So the first option we'll look at, and again we've talked about this a little bit earlier, and Emma has, has talked about the UK version of it, pay as you save. What is it? Look, you put together a fund to lend out for these sort of investments. That's available to the consumer, 
in a very easy, hassle-free vein through the, uh, the providers of the service. They'll say, look, we're coming and this sort of funding is available to you. There's a lean on the home or the meter. In the US, uh, it's tended to be on the home. In the UK, they're looking at the lean being on the meter. And what that essentially means is this isn't a loan to the actual personal homeowner. It's actually on the home or the meter. The repayment comes through the energy bill or the local authority bill. In the UK, they're looking at the energy bill. The repayment fee is generally in line with the reduction in energy use. So, you know, you borrow 8000 to invest in your home, your energy bills are reduced by 800 a year, that's 10,000 year, 10 year repayment to, to pay that back with a little bit extra maybe for the, for the interest rates. Um, but the important thing for the homeowner, I suppose, is there is no upfront cost to them. The money is there for them. So essentially they're paying a fee, almost like a lease fee for the use of the upgrade in the house. And the loan stays with the home. It doesn't stay with them. It transfers if there's any sale. The challenges there is, I suppose, homeowners. In our research, they found it hard to differentiate between, hey, I own the loan, it's, I'm responsible for it, and this home, this inanimate object, or this meter, which is even more inanimate to them, owns this loan. That's just a difficulty, and it's a, it's a communication barrier that we need to un overcome with them. The other challenge is the fund. You know, who funds it? Is it government back? But even if it was government back, where does the money come from, essentially? The golden rule that they talk about in the UK, people weren't that fond of that in Ireland. Uh, they were like, well, if I've got more money, can't I pay it back quicker? I don't like being in debt. I, I want to pay off my loans as quickly as I can. So, again, it might be more of a, a golden guideline in Ireland than uh, a, a rule. Um, the other thing that people were concerned about is, look, the change of use of the house happens. So if you say the repayment is X amount because that's the saving on the energy bill, what if I have a, a load of kids? What if I start to work at home? What if my children move out and now there's only two of us in the house? So good points. Um, on the green bank, so what is that? Well, we're looking at uh, green, bank, uh, green banks are out there already. They're usually for environmental projects. In this case, we'd be looking at energy efficiency projects specifically. Again, they're often uh, government backed, uh, but there could be some EU involvement there. There's, uh, there's EU project bonds out there at the moment being talked about and there for, for maybe large community projects. So if we, if we had community initiatives, then maybe that's an area that we could look at. Um, there's a lack of profit motive, which again uh, could make the consumer a little more trusting of going to a green bank. What are the challenges? Well, it's a new vehicle, so there are costs around establishment, and Catherine talked about that. We need to be careful about thinking about that, you know, creating something new when maybe we have vehicles that we can change a little to, to work for us. Um, any new organization in the financing sector that you're going to establish needs to have a high credit rating to attract funding. Uh, again, presently, that's a challenge. The access for capital rates will be a challenge. Um, you know, at the moment, we're looking at downgrading of people's energy ratings. So how, how do we turn that around? The examples of green banks out there at the moment, uh, there are a German state-owned bank, KFW, that is already uh, lending in the market and has been very successful. 10 billion lent over the last 10 years. So that, we can see that there are models out there that are working for that. Um, what's the good things about it? Well, it could create confidence for these new energy efficiency projects. As, as Brendan said, it is a, in some ways a cottage industry at the moment. We need to build the confidence and build the recognition of the brand, and this could be maybe a way to, to get funding to those sort of projects. Consumers also liked it. Um, they were more trusting of something like this. Looking at the next one then is looking at private savings. and. Uh, Again, this could be two ways of doing this. You could create a fund so that uh, people look to invest in this fund and they get you know, good returns, uh, or we could look at leveraging domestic savings and encouraging self-funding by people by giving them tax breaks. So you might create a fund uh, where people get nice returns and because they feel good about uh, investing in such a fund that is going to upgrade 
um, the, the homes in Ireland, they're more likely to invest. Or you could say to people, well, look, you, you've got all these pots of money, um, and we do have pots of money in savings in that we're at the moment uh, sitting on them saying what's going to happen in the future. And maybe it's getting people to open their purse strings on that. And uh, we can do that through, as Lisa called it, fiscal instruments earlier on by uh, um, tax breaks. What are the challenges in something like that? Well, you know, if the government is going to be involved in, in either the fund or in tax breaks, clearly that has an effect on the exchequer position and we need to look at that uh, in the wider context. And the other thing is, you know, you need to attract investors and people are savvy. They'll be looking at, well, what sort of return are you going to give me for investment in this fund? So it has to be attractive to those uh, looking to invest. Examples of it are at the moment in France, they do have tax-free savings accounts. Um, uh, to create funds uh, that are then used to, to lend to energy efficiency projects. Also in the Netherlands, they have issued green bonds, so that's something that perhaps government could look at. Um, the good thing about this is you don't need to go to the international markets looking for finance. You get the finance right at home. And, uh, you know, that means that you could leverage Irish money to invest in this. Um, consumers also like this. Uh, they like the feeling of, of the investment and doing something good for the country. And they also, uh, they, I suppose, likened it in one way to the credit union. You save a bit and you, you lend a bit. So there was a little bit of liking that, uh, that two side of the same coin. Then looking at the traditional financing options that are out there already, there's the equity release uh, option and um, Bank of Ireland is one of those that has an equity release at the moment where you can actually borrow to invest and upgrade in your home. It's, it's directly linked to the Better Energy scheme. Um, they're mortgage type rates, so more attractive to consumers. Um, and you don't actually have to have an existing mortgage or be an existing customer with them. You also have the mortgage top-ups where, you know, if somebody already has a mortgage, they can go to their bank and look for a top-up on that mortgage at similar sort of mortgage-style rates, which are generally in the 3 to 5% rate. So again, you know, we shouldn't forget they're out there already, and, and maybe we can look at leveraging those. There's also green loans that are out there, and there's many providers um, giving those, and I, I note that uh, Permanent TSB uh, announced this morning that they're coming out with a, a new one. Um, the challenges, I suppose, on, on those is around uh, debt restructuring costs for consumers. You know, if you get a mortgage top-up or equity release, well, what if you were already in, uh, on a tracker mortgage? Can I still keep that or do I lose that? And, you know, is that not as attractive for me? Or if you've got to go and, and look at my house, what's the transaction costs around legal fees and all of those uh, things? Um, again, people in negative equity, you know, is this suitable for them? No, it's not um, for a lot of them. And then if you're looking at green loans, you know, the interest rates in those are still up around the 10% level, which, again, for a longer term investment just isn't sustainable. So what are we saying about all of those things? Well, there are challenges, and I suppose uh, the main one is it doesn't matter what finance option we're looking at. It's the cost of finance that's paramount. Where are we going to get the money for these investments from and at what cost? So that is the first thing we look, need to look at no matter what finance option we talk about. The vehicle comes next. Then we can decide, well, which one suits better and, and maybe there's a number of them that work together to achieve what we need. On the demand side, we need to address consumer behaviour. We need to look at you know, getting them going deeper, getting them to actually move, to go ahead and do it and getting them to assess the cost benefit, so making them understand the concept. On providing information, consumers need to know what to do. We need to help them with that. We need to, to help them out to give them advice. Communication is key as well. Consumers want to understand, and as Catherine said, they're, they're very savvy in the Irish market. So, you know, we believe that where there were questions about, well, how is pays different than my personal loan? Consumers will understand that. We just need to know to con how to communicate that message to them. Conclusions. Okay, so our feeling was, at the end of the day, there isn't a silver bullet at the moment. Um, it won't be solved quickly and not necessarily easily, but we do need to start. We need to get on this road and begin now. 
one size is unlikely to fit all. Look, consumers are different. They're different people, different circumstances, different requirements. We need to be aware of that. And maybe there's not just one solution. Maybe there's a number of solutions. We need to listen to consumers within that. And then we need to position the options based on their concerns so that we're communicating it properly to them so that they can see the benefits. Above all, we need to look at affordable sources of finance. How are we going to make this an attractive proposition at attractive rates? And lastly, for whatever options we choose, we need to test them, to pilot them, see how they work, and refine them based on feedback. That's it for me. Thank you.